And um, we want to just go ahead to introduce our guest speakers for today. We have three guest speakers for this um, webinar session. And we have Jamie Katz, um, is a state grassland specialist with USDA. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today. We also have Paul McDonald, state program specialist. Um, Jamie, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Um, and finally, we have um, Joe All, the director of Farm Service Agency. Thank you, um, Joe, for taking time to join us today. Without much ado, I'm just going to ask um, Jamie to uh, introduce himself and just um, share his presentation with us. Over to you, um, Jamie. Thank you. All right. Let me... Uh... Let me get this started here. Can you see everything all right? Yeah, I can see you, um, Jamie. Yep. Let's see. Let me. There we go. How about now? Oh, great. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so sorry about that. No um, my name is uh, Jamie Kurtz, as, as he said. Um, I'm the state grassland specialist here for Missouri. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, some, some drought recovery strategies. So I've got kind of a short uh, presentation here, and then um, we'll take some questions. But um, with the drought, we've had several droughts uh, coming, coming and going here. Uh, it seems like we're getting more, more droughts that are lasting a little longer. So... Um, I try to turn turn that negative uh, effect of the drought into a positive one. Um, this is a, a good opportunity to enhance your system um, and try to get better prepared for for the next drought. Um, you know, a couple of things we can do that are relatively inexpensive uh, is just do a better job of managing what you have. Um, you know, I was told a long time ago there's no silver bullet that'll fix everything. Uh, so so possibly just installing some more paddocks. Uh, slow your rotations down. Uh, I know we're we're talking mainly with small ruminants here, but it'd go for about any class of livestock. Um, you know, by slowing slowing that rotation down, you can grow more forage uh, because it's it's got a longer recovery time. Um, and like I said, my my motto is you can grow more forage with rest than you can with fertilizer. Um, you know, consider increasing the flexibility of your system. Um, you know, if you've got a lot of woven wire out there. Uh, or or barbed wire, consider adding some electric fence in uh, to add flexibility, allow you to to um, cut paddocks down or make paddocks bigger. Um, like I said, increasing and decreasing um, stocking density sometimes is a good way to to recover that forage base. But um, and then finally, uh, create a more diverse forage base. Um, you know, this has kind of been a big big topic for us as an agency here uh, the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, these weaker stands in your pastures probably aren't going to survive the drought as well as your stronger ones. Um, so we could use this as an opportunity to renovate um, add warm season grasses and possibly include summer annuals into your system. Um, warm season grasses, uh, it's kind of kind of the main main thing I'm going to touch on today. Um, there's been a big push for native warm season grasses here with some of our uh, initiatives that's gone through uh, that we've worked with with several agencies, but uh, there's also our introduced grasses. I know um, I'm from Howe County, um, West Plains area, so we use a lot of Bermuda grass, uh, Old World blue stems, Caucasian crabgrass, along with our native grass. Uh, where up here in, in Columbia, where I'm at today, uh, we're probably not going to see as much of that Bermuda and, and Old World blue stem. Um, as far north as, as we are here. Um, summer annuals um, is a great way to, to integrate um, a high production crop uh, that's a high quality crop. Um, they're high yielding, but they are expensive. Uh, so this is probably not gonna be a, a forever fix for most people, but it can kind of help with the stop gap. Um, you know, using millet, sorghum sedan, corn, hay beans, sun hemp, uh, all of those uh, are some crops that we can use to help renovate fields to get them ready to plant a perennial crop. Um, as I said, NFI, the Native Forage Initiative, is an initiative that we're still uh, working on now. 
Uh, it's it's one of our climate smart agriculture um, initiatives that we've been focuses, focusing on. And to date, we've we've either planned or planted uh, nearly 14,000 acres of native warm season grass um, in the state of Missouri. And this this has been a, a huge support uh, or a huge success due to support from several agencies like MU, uh, Ducks Unlimited, MDC. Um, we've all kind of been working together on this one. Um, so kind of kind of re reiterating, um, you know, one of the biggest things uh, that we can do that's that's low cost is slow down these rotations, um, allow that grass to recover um, between the grazing events and something else to keep in, you know, supplemental feeding can get you through, but you're never going to feed your way out of a drought. Um, every time we look at, uh, you know, what hay costs do in a drought, they're going to be extremely high. Concentrated feeds are going to be high. So, you know, having a destocking plan, um, whether, like I said, whether it's, uh, you know, cattle or, or goats or sheep or anything, uh, you need to have a plan in mind, whether it's a, a certain date by a certain date in the calendar. Um, you know, if we don't have rain by this date, we need to, to destock. Um, this is a great opportunity to cull cull animals. Um, you know, we culled several last year out of our herd that probably should have been culled several years before, but uh, we're, you know, this kind of forced our hand to do it and retain your replacements. Um, that smaller uh, animal replacement animal is going to be, be cheaper to feed, easier to feed, and you can start to, uh, you know, getting that desirable genetics into your, into your herd. That's, that's basically what I've got. Uh, for right now, I'll stop sharing. Maybe. All right. Thanks so much, um, Jim, for that presentation. I know the audience will be um, preparing their questions for you. I'm going to turn over right now to Paul for, um, for him to take over. Paul, please go ahead. Go All right. On. Thank you, David. All right. Like David said, my name is Paul McDonald. I am um, an equip coordinator in the state of Missouri. And what that really means is there's a program that we have that's called the Environmental Quality Incentives Program <clears throat> in Missouri that we do a lot of um, different things with. And I'll get into that a little bit later in the, in the presentation, but that is kind of my task uh, area of responsibility. And so we've got several programs that we work with in the state, and I'll share a few of them with you today. But uh, I'm going to get into, uh, you know, how does NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, how do they provide assistance? And what, what really do we uh, do when we work with uh, landowners on site? And so first thing we're what we really do is, um, you know, if we get some interest from you, if you call us or stop by the office and talk to us, uh, generally the first thing we're, we're going to do is we're going to set up a site visit with you um, to talk to you about, um, you know, what you have on your place, uh, what things that um, you would like to improve and start to look at, um, you know, things that we think uh, could use some help and that what you think needs to um, could use some help out there on your place. And so uh, really what that does is uh, what we talk about a lot in, in RCS is resource concerns and um, what our ultimate goal is to take those resource concerns and uh, get them to a better state or uh, a level that um, is fully operational essentially and not ne needing any other level of treatment out there. And so, so one of our goals is to work with you and figure out what would fit best into your operation, uh, what would work, what wouldn't work, and uh, try to come up with a plan uh, that would fit your, um, fit your farm or, or land. <clears throat> And so uh, we're always working with the landowner with their goals in mind. And uh, obviously we've got some rules that we've got to follow. And sometimes those uh, help guide some of the decisions, but ultimately we want this plan to work for uh, the, the landowner. And uh, so that uh, it's really a plan that could be implemented, imp implemented for the long term and not just for a short term uh, gain. 
And so we've got some financial assistance that, uh, that we can utilize as well. So I was talking about resource concerns, and that's really what a lot of our um, goals tied back to. And the, and the first thing, uh, and really what our agency was based on originally back when it started in 1933 was soil erosion and uh, controlling soil erosion. And so um, that along with a lot of other resource concerns uh, are our priorities uh, now. You heard Jim, Jamie mention climate smart. And so there are some other things that over time have been added to the agency. And so probably about I don't know, 15 years ago, soil health became um, a, a big thing with our agency and trying to improve soil health. And so uh, when we have folks out there on site, you know, they're going to be looking for uh, places that maybe need help with soil erosion. They're going to be looking for indicators uh, on soil health uh, out there on your farm and can doc talk to you about ways to improve that. And then, you know, water management uh, with livestock that could be um, you know, moving um, uh, water to places that it would uh, be more beneficial to the operation. Um, improving water quality, uh, we've got those things in mind. Uh, figuring out ways to improve your plant health, uh, you know, meet the livestock uh, forage needs out there on the farm. If you've got wildlife goals, uh, generally that is uh, always something that um, we can make some plans for. If you've got some ideas on um, places that you could uh, improve some wildlife habitat and then air quality and energy, uh, those two have become more important over the last several years with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was passed and um, the emphasis on uh, improving air quality and energy reduction. And so what what practices do we usually utilize for some of these um, resource concerns. And so uh, for soil erosion, uh, there, there's a, a lot of them uh, that we utilize just depending on the land use. But for pasture land, uh, generally speaking, for soil erosion, uh, the two main practices that we're going to be looking at is a forage and biomass planting or critical area planting. And the critical area planting is just, just basically on some of those sites that are have been bare for a long time. Just think about like high traffic areas or old feed yards or something like along those lines that uh, need a little bit of extra treatment. Or if you've got some um, gullies that maybe need to be repaired uh, and they can be solved with a planting instead of some kind of permanent structure out there. <clears throat> but you heard Jamie talk about the, our, our native forage initiative and that's been a success over the last year. Started in 20. 23 fiscal year 2023 for us and uh, we've got it continued on into uh, this fiscal year and it's basically to plant uh, native grasses or plants out there on on your site to convert some some of that land to uh, some native native grasslands and for summer pasture and so uh, for soil erosion um, that's kind of what our main um, practices are uh, for soil health, um, you know, probably best case scenario for improving soil health, we were putting uh, those native native grass stands out there. Uh, that'd probably be the pinnacle of uh, what we're going to be doing for soil health. Obviously, there's some ways to do something beyond that, but uh, prescribed grazing goes a long ways uh, in improving soil health as well. So for water quality, I've just got pest management on here, but uh, there's several other practices that could key into that. But uh, with pest management, you know, we're looking at uh, what we can do to improve um, the amount of, uh, or reduce the amount of uh, leaching and runoff uh, that we put on or any pesticides that we've got going out there. And then for uh, air and water quality, uh, nutrient management, uh, just basically putting on uh, the correct amount of fertilizer uh, at the right time. And we've got some assessments that we try to do uh, with soil tests, uh, generally through the university or other labs. Uh, something that we call the phosphorus index, which basically takes into account the amount of phosphorus you have in uh, your soil and the uh, index on uh, how how much we think it's going to run off or um, move off this off the system. 
And then uh, nitrogen uh, leaching index as well, kind of like the same thing is uh, uh, similar to the phosphorus index and in trying to figure out how, how likely that nitrogen is to leave the site. And then, uh, you know, reducing um, soil erosion with nutrient management. So for, for plant health and vigor, um, you know, a lot of these come in into play uh, for uh, plant health and vigor, you know, the, the forage and biomass plantings to improve um, something like that, uh, prescribed grazing, uh, which is generally, uh, you know, coming up with a plan and uh, grazing according to um, our standards. And so uh, you've heard about management intensive grazing before, I'm sure. And so really just uh, like Jamie said, giving your pastures rest and um, allowing those to regrow. And then uh, to, to accomplish that, we generally have, we'll put uh, fence uh, wells, uh, ponds, watering facilities out there to help, help move or get that system to a better place where we can manage that grass a little bit better. All right, so uh, financial assistance that we provide to uh, our users. So generally speaking, um, if you're interested in some of our financial assistance, we've, we've got to, um, you know, you, you have to make some sort of contact with our office and then our field staff will uh, generally run you through what paperwork is required. We've got some application paperwork that is needed. And then we've got, we've got to set up some records and uh, move through essentially uh, a process uh, to get your application in. And so all of our programs uh, through the federal side are, are competitive programs. And so uh, just because you apply doesn't necessarily mean that uh, your application is gonna get funded, but we'll, we've got some ranking systems in place that uh, we'll run through. And uh, if your application uh, is a higher ranking application, uh, then obviously your chances of getting in funded are a lot higher. And so the two main programs that NRCS works with in the state of Missouri are the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and the Conservation Stewardship Program. And so just briefly here, I've got some sign up dates because these are really coming up pretty quick. So for EQIP, which is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the sign up deadline is on Friday, March 29th, excuse me, and to be eligible for basically for fiscal year 24 uh, funding. And for the CSP, which is a conservation stewardship program, we've still got that sign up deadline that goes through June 14th. So a little bit later on into the year, but essentially uh, EQIP uh, is really kind of our bread and butter, uh, what we work with a lot, especially for uh, folks that haven't worked with us before. And uh, it covers the whole gamut of uh, conservation practices specifically uh, for, um, for grazing operations, um, it's what we use to essentially set up uh, a grazing system uh, to get to that, that place where we are managing for prescribed grazing. And so um, both programs really we can use on cropland, pasture land, uh, land that you want to work with with wildlife, something we call the associated ag land, just generally that land that um, is kind of the odd areas on your farm uh, that really uh, hard to use for a lot of things. And then uh, sometimes for farmstead, we've got some stuff that we can do on farmstead as well. And so um, you can see the link down at the bottom of my screen. And if you don't know where the office is that uh, is closest to you, you can click on that website or you can go to that website and there will be uh, a link on there that essentially says something along the lines of, you know, find your local field office and uh, you pick your state and then pick your uh, county and then it'll give you uh, all the contact deals, details for that, uh, for that local field office and you can get in contact with them and uh, they can come out and work with you on, on setting up a, up a farm plan and uh, trying to figure out what you might or might not be eligible for. So I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into EQIP on what, uh, what are our common practices for grazing lands, <clears throat> especially um, 
for um, Southern Missouri and uh, kind of, you know, if you're around the Osceola area, like uh, where David's, uh, David's at, uh, a lot of times what we're uh, working with with grazing lands is, um, you know, setting up a water source, uh, which would be a well. It could be a pond as well if you've got some existing ponds or if you have sites that um, could easily be uh, a pond could be built and uh, installing some pipeline, livestock pipeline, watering facilities, it's a heavy use area, which is the gravel pad around um, our tanks, which are watering facilities, uh, some fence uh, could be, depending on your site, if, you, if it's needed, those forage and biomass plantings uh, and brush management and herbaceous weed control. And so um, that's, that's kind of where uh, we are with Equip. Uh, Jamie just showed me a question uh, in the chat and asked if there's a farm size requirement. And there is not a farm size requirement. It just, um, you know, if you're if you're managing land, we've got sites that we're working with that, um, you know, are an acre in size, uh, especially in urban areas. Uh, that could be small lots or less than an acre uh, that we're working with on things. And so um, there's really no uh, size requirement, but it has to be managing. You have to be the manager of that land or associate with that land, essentially. Uh, so. <clears throat> There's not really uh, a minimum uh, operating size on, on that. So for the conservation stewardship program or what we call CSP, essentially with this, it's a little bit different with EQIP. Uh, if you're the owner or operator, it uh, doesn't make a difference. Um, if you're the operator wanting to install some practices on the land, uh, that's definitely doable, uh, but you're going to have to get the owner to sign off on it. With the conservation stewardship program, you have to be the operator of the land. And so if you own and operate the land, then um, obviously you'd be eligible for the program. If you own the land, but you rent it out to somebody else, then the person that is renting the land or managing the land would be the one that would be eligible to sign up for this program. So it has to be basically the person that is managing the land that would be eligible for this program. So it could be owning it, could be operating it or owning and operating it. Uh, but if you're renting or managing the land for ag production, uh, this program, you'd be eligible for this program. And so uh, this one, this program, so with EQIP, it's more of a, we we'll do like the structural practices to get uh, things into place. And um, so just think about all those things that we do that you can see like the um, water wells with the, um, the pipelines, tanks, uh, fences, that sort of thing. With the conservation stewardship program, it's more of a management program. And so it's things that uh, you're going to do out there on your on your land that um, maybe you just if you're driving by, you wouldn't be able to see. And so uh, could be um, for grazing lands, could be uh, setting up some stockpile areas, could be uh, managing your um, grass so that um, essentially you're managing it so that uh, the seed heads are going to be delayed, something along those lines. And so there's some different uh, management things that you can do. And so with this, uh, we'll essentially run you through a process uh, where, where we're going to look at those resource concerns, like I talked about with, you know, the water quality, with soil erosion, with soil health, uh, with air quality and energy and that sort of thing. We're going to run one, run your application through a process. And if you meet two of those resource concerns at the time of your application, um, essentially that opens the door for you applying for it. And uh, by the end of the contract, you'd have to meet or exceed at least one other additional resource concerns besides those first two. And so with this, the minimum uh, contract payment is 4,000 a year. That just went up this year. Before this year is about $1,500. And so uh, that's uh, a lot better uh, minimum payment than uh, we have had. But those contracts are a five-year contract and kind of one of the things that you have to be cautious of with this contract is uh, essentially like your management can't necessarily change um, from the start to the finish unless uh, your management gets better essentially. So it just has to maintain whatever minimum you've signed up for 
um, and you can't go below that. Uh, or, um, you know, if you have land that uh, you own, um, um, if you're thinking about selling land and that sort of thing, uh, that could be a potential contract violation. And that's not something we would want to get you into um, if you're if you're thinking along those lines. So anyway, that's all that's all I have. Thank you so much, um, Paul. Yeah, and there's a question. Is a follow-up question. I would love you to please answer. Um, could you please okay. talk about the Act Now sign up for drought-stricken areas? That program, you know, people would like to know about that, please. Okay, so we have a couple of Act Nows related to the drought, and one of them is what Jamie mentioned earlier. It's the Native Forage Grass Initiative. And uh, like I said, the sign-up deadline for that is uh, March 29th at this point. And so if you're interested in that, uh, be, con be in contact with your local offices fairly quickly by Friday uh, to sign your application for that. And so, and that's really converting, uh, you know, land that uh, is already in production, maybe from fescue uh, to some native forage grass. Uh, so to help out with uh, that uh, that summer uh, grazing. The other is we've got a uh, livestock water um, drought area, and I'm trying to remember, but we've, basically there's five counties in west central Missouri that that is in. So it'd be uh, Vernon, Barton, uh, St. Clair, and I think there's two others, and I can't remember what they are right off the top of my head, but um, if you give me a give me a moment, I'll put those counties in the chat. Uh, I'll look that up and I'll get those in the chat. And so that's going on. And that that one uh, is going through May 3rd. The sign up on that is going through May 3rd. And so that's basically just if you need emergency water, essentially. So pastures have dried up, your ponds have dried up and you've got no water on sites where essentially uh, you used to have water. Uh, that's what that program is designed for, but it's only in uh, basically our five hardest hit counties with drought for the last two to three years, essentially, is, is where that money is targeted towards. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, don't forget, we still have the expert with us, you know, so please try sending your questions and they're all able to answer them. I'm going to turn over right now to Joe for his presentation, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. Thank you. Joe, over to you. Yeah, David, and thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be a part of your program. Thanks for inviting me. And, uh, you know, if you come, <laughs> would come visit our state office in Missouri at one time, we don't have it set up right now, but if you would come and visit our state office and ring the doorbell, here's what you would hear. that's our that's our doorbell i'm not sure if that's a goat or a sheep but it's one of the, it's one of the two so if you come visit that might be what you hear but hey good to be with you today i'm joe all i'm the uh, state executive director of the federal farm service agency and you know I, i'll be honest with you i don't know a lot about raising goats and, and uh, sheep but we do have some programs that we think could help you out so i thought i might talk a little bit about the farm service agency let you know what we're all about what we think we can do to help you and be glad to entertain any questions um we're a part of usda just like nrcs is we're we're sister agencies we work very closely together on a lot of programs also rural development is in our our uh, area too. Uh, we have risk management, that's crop insurance. Now, a lot of people talk about soil and water, uh, the soil and water, they're in a lot of our offices. They're a state agency. We're federal government, but they're a state agency. But a lot of times they're located in the same facility that we are. But we're just like, a, we're like a big bank. Uh, we try to assist farmers, ranchers, producers any way we can. You know, one question we get, people will say, well, do you all have grants? We do not really have that many grants. We have some loans, and I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. But what we basically do, if you have some hard times in your farming, your ranching operation, if, say, you get hit by disaster weather, attacks, things like that, we've got some programs where you can get some payments that will help out with that. Also, uh, we, have, we just completed what we call our agricultural risk 
price loss coverage where folks, when the prices of crops drops below normal, uh, we have some programs to help with that. And we also have a wide variety of loans. And I'll talk about those loan opportunities here in just a minute. Uh, we also have conservation programs to try to pre preserve grasses and try to help with wildlife and things like that. So I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Our state office is in Columbia, Columbia, Missouri. We have about 25 people that work in our state office. And here's the thing about FSA. We've got 94 offices across the state of Missouri. Most counties have their own offices. I think we have 114 counties in the state. We have 94 <clears throat> FSA offices in, in the state. And I mean, in your area, we've got one in Osceola, St. Clair County. We've got an office in Clinton. We've got one in Butler. We've got one in Nevada. We've got one in Lincoln. We've got one in Hermitage. Those are just some of the counties where we have a local FSA office. And you're welcome to visit any county office that you want to, you want to visit. So, I mean, your closest in St. Clair County would be the Osceola office, but if you'd prefer to visit another office, you're certainly, certainly welcome to do that. We've got a great staff. We've got, in most of our offices, we have a county director. We also have what we call program technicians. These folks are very knowledgeable. They're very caring. Uh, they work hard and they can help you anytime you need help in a lot of different ways. So I would certainly encourage you to visit, to visit your, your local office. Um, our each county office is governed by a county committee, and that county committee is elected by producers in that particular area. So, you know, in the, for instance, in St. Clair uh, County, you've got a county committee for St. Clair, and they make a lot of decisions for that particular office. So, you know, I would encourage you, we, we, can't, we can't make any of you successful. But we try to be sure everybody's on a level playing field. That's basically what we try to do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of our disaster programs. And this, these would apply to you uh, sheep and goat producers. You know, the biggest disaster we've had in Missouri here the last few years has been drought. And you all realize the last couple of years, drought has been terrible. I don't know what we're in for this coming year, but it could be a, you know, we need some rain right now in a lot of parts of the state, I know. But the drought's been a big issue. And, and I think one of the big issues is climate change. And be, people will argue back and forth. I hear some agricultural producers say, we don't think climate change is all that serious. But there's a lot of scientific research. And there are a lot of folks out there that it seems pretty obvious that our climate could very well be changing. And you look at the hot summers that we're having, we've had the last few years, the lack of rainfall. I think climate change is, is something that I think it's out there myself. I think it's a reality, but you know, they'll, we can talk on different sides of the coin. And so one of the priorities of USDA is what we call climate smart agriculture. And this applies maybe more to crop producers than it does to livestock producers. But basically what climate change or climate smart agriculture try to do two things, keep the greenhouse gas emissions out of the air and try to keep the carbon in the soil. And we have different practices like no or low till farming, uh, things like using organic fertilizer, crop rotation, uh, you know, cover crops. Those are just some ideas of climate smart agriculture to try to pr protect the environment as well as to be productive in your operation. The first slide that's come out, you can see some of our disaster relief programs. And I think you can print, we've got several handouts. I think you can probably print these out, but I'm going to go through, I'm going to talk to ones that, about the programs that would apply maybe to you sheep and, and goat uh, producers ranchers. The first one is the Livestock Forage Program, LFP. And that's a drought-related program. I imagine a lot of you probably qualified for that this last year. I might mention a lot of our programs designed for livestock, we consider sheep and goats to be livestock. So you all will qualify for a lot of the programs that we have. I don't know if you're acquainted with the Federal Drought Monitor, but the Federal Drought Monitor is the instrument that determines eligibility for a lot of our drought relief programs. And the Drought Monitor has like five different categories. You have to hit level three on the Drought Monitor anytime during the year. If you hit that number, then you qualify for a lot of these programs. Or you can hit drought two or drought level two for eight consecutive weeks. So, so those are the two ways that you qualify for a lot of the different programs. And if any part of your county hits, let's say, D3 on the drought monitor, your whole county is eligible for these drought relief programs. I mentioned the livestock forage program. So if your county did hit level three for each of your livestock, for each of your goats, each of your sheep, 
you can you register the number that you have and we pay like around 36 to 40 dollars per animal and i think you're up to get three monthly payments as many as three monthly payments during this time and it all you have to do is hit that level three uh, qualification last year we issued around 173 million dollars across the state of missouri to on lfp or livestock forage program so a lot of people did get some help i hope some of you all did too and again the new drought season will start in April. So the 2024 drought calculation will start in April. So we'll see where the numbers come in. The second program down is what we call the ELAP, and we're great on acronyms at, at FSA, but the ELAP program is the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program. And that's where if you have a shortage of grazing grasses, uh, you know, feed for your animals, hay, things like that, or a shortage of water, we will pay you so much transportation costs to go pick up some hay or other feed stocks or to pick up water for your operation. And that program is just, it, we do still have a few people are doing that right now. And again, that, that uh, you have to hit level three on the drought monitor to qualify for this program. Now we don't pay for the hay and the water, but we'll pay the transportation costs. So you can go and you can, you can travel up to a thousand miles to pick up the hay. We like to see you pick it up closer to home, but you can travel a pretty, pretty long distance to do that. If you look down the third program, LIP, Livestock Indem Indemnity Program, and that's one you all might qualify. You know, I, I've heard somebody uh, mentioned, uh, I think maybe it was, uh, Deborah, maybe it was you who sent us an email about avian flu or the avian bird flu and how that's maybe impacting some of the, the sheep around. Uh, Livestock yeah, I sent an email um, this morning. Did you send that, David? Okay. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, the Livestock Indemnity Program, what that involves, if you have a more than normal number of deaths of any of your livestock during a particular time, you can qualify for some money for that. And, you know, this could be for the super cold weather when it's very cold, like it was in January this year, when it gets extremely hot. Now, drought is not considered a condition for this, but if the weather gets extremely hot, if you have animal attacks, if you have animal diseases, so you talk about this avian flu, that could be a qualifying, a qualifying uh, event that would trigger this program. So what livestock indemnity means, if you have more than the normal number of deaths in any year due to these conditions I've talked about, then you could qualify for that. And normally uh, it pays up to 75% of the value of livestock for this program. See, why don't we flip over to the next. Uh, emergency conservation program, as if you have a shortage of water, yeah, you can uh, qualify for that. Uh, you can do things like bring in tanks, bring in pumps, uh, even can drill a can drill a well under this program, but again, the county committee has to has to apply for this program for a person to qualify or for a county to qualify. And again, this is where if you hit uh, either D three on the drought monitor or have a forty percent reduction in rainfall over a four month period, you'd qualify for this. Uh, the next program down is NAP. It's called the Non Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program. You know, a lot of a lot of producers have crop insurance. But we've got like, and I'm not sure how many of you all probably farm row crops just like you do uh, sheep and cattle, but uh, the NAP program is designed for crops that maybe are not covered under crop insurance. We're getting more and more, more diversified in terms of the different crops that are produced. So the NAP program applies to that. A part of the NAP program is also the NAP coverage for grazing. And if you have at least a 50% loss of grazing grasses over what you normally have, you can qualify for NAP insurance a payment on that also. Steve, why don't we flip over to the next, the next slide. Um, a program that's in place right now, if you look down ELRP, that's the Emergency Livestock Relief Program 2022. And that for that, if you, uh, if you hit level three back in the year 2022 on the drought monitor, uh, if you had a significant loss in grazing grasses due to drought or wildfires during 2022, you can qualify for some payment under the Emergency Livestock Relief Program. And once again, this does apply to goats and applies to sheep. So, you know, if you had that big loss in 2022, if your county hit level three on the drought monitor, you could qualify for that program also. And you've got the other programs. You can print this up. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to, just to mention those. So, Steve, why don't we go on to the next slide? Go on, skip through that. Now, another thing we have at FSA, we have a lot of loans. 
And uh, we have some very, well, we, we say are very attractive loans. Um, for instance, the first loan, I, I mentioned, first of all, we have two basic types of loans. We have the direct loan and the guaranteed loan. A direct loan is a loan that we make directly from the Farm Service Agency. That's a loan between the producer and our agency. A guaranteed loan is a loan that goes through the bank, but then we back it up. FSA backs up that loan if something would go wrong. So you've got the direct, the guaranteed loan. One, one loan that's very popular is what we call the farm ownership loan. And if you wanna purchase a farm house, you wanna purchase farm land, uh, if you wanna construct uh, new farm buildings, uh, enlarge an existing farm, improve structure, improve your structures. You could you could obtain a farm ownership loan, and those are those are very attractive. We also have a loan called the farm operating loan, and that's for if you want to buy any type of equipment. You might want to buy a tractor. You might want to buy a pickup truck. Uh, you might want to buy livestock. Uh, you might want to buy grain. You might want to buy equipment to work to till the soil or work the grasses or whatever. Those are called the farm operating loans, and those loans are are very popular. Also, a lot of machinery falls, and you can see, and you can read through this printout. I'm not going to cover everything. But we've also even got what we call micro loans. Those are loans that are a much smaller scale loan, and we also even have youth loans. And these loans are designed for like <clears throat> students in 4-H, maybe students in the FFA uh, program, just some things maybe to try to get young people started in in agriculture, try to encourage them to get started. And the nice thing about our loans, our loans, we normally have a pretty decent loan rate. I'm thinking on the farm ownership loans and the farm operating loans. Last time I saw, they were in the 5% interest range. But we usually have some pretty competitive rates. And the nice thing about FSA loans also, we can be very flexible in what kind of a spending plan you have. I mean, if they're, maybe they need to be adjusted in terms of how you make your payments, when you make your payments, We've got some flexibility in that, and we can also extend our loans out as many as 40 years. So we can get some pretty good rates. And I'm not going to tell you, hey, we're better than the banks or the banks are better than us. But what I what I would suggest, if you need to borrow some money for your farm operation, go to the bank, see what they can do with you, to you. Uh, go to the FSA, your local office, and see what programs they have also. And we think we could, you know, Look, see where you can get the best deal. But we feel like we have some very attractive loan opportunities, some loan possibilities. So we'd encourage you to visit your local office and, and take care of that. I don't know how many of you are involved in conservation projects, maybe convert some of your land to conservation, but uh, there is a way you can receive a rental rate on your property if you agree to convert part of your land to conservation, to grow grasses that maybe help prevent soil erosion, uh, help wildlife for to help for the wildlife situation or you know maybe even to water quality so we try to encourage conservation again you can get some money a rental rate get some rental money for converting part of your land to conservation the last thing i'd mention and steve we might flip over is the last thing is an overview of the federal farm bill and i'm not going to go through this right now you probably know this but the farm bill is what controls usda Congress enacts the Farm Bill, and that's that's our Bible. That Those are the guidelines that we have to follow at USDA. And right now, the Farm Bill was supposed to have been developed back in 2023. But right now, we don't have a new Farm Bill, so we're still operating under the 2018 Farm Bill. But the Farm Bill is a very important document, and Congress is dealing with that right now. And you can see there are 12 titles in the Farm Bill. Livestock falls under Title 12. So you can see what different areas are covered in different parts of the Farm Bill. And for me to, to wrap up, so I know we might want to have time for questions, but our goal with FSA, we want to try to help as many producers as we can. We can't help everybody, but we want to try to help as many producers as we can. And I think you all probably know this, a lot of smaller and mid-sized farmers and ranchers are being pushed out these days. A lot of farming is going the corporate direction. It's going to the bigger, the bigger entities. We like to help that smaller and mid-sized farmer, rancher, and producer and, you know, we certainly try to do that. And again, we encourage the folks in our county office, we say, hey, think outside the box. Uh, try to figure a way, maybe be creative and figure a way to help a producer. Also, we say, hey, sometimes you need to take a chance. Maybe look at somebody and say, maybe on paper, that person might not be the best risk, but we think they've got potential 
to really have a successful operation. So we try to take chances and try to help as many people as we can. And, you know, as I said, we can't help everybody, but we want to try to help as many as we can. So if you don't remember anything else I say today, my suggestion would be get to know the people in your local county office. Get to whatever county office you want to do business with. Get to meet those folks, develop a relationship with them. And they can, they can provide you a lot of help, a lot of opportunity about a lot of different things. And sometimes maybe you won't qualify for a certain program, but somebody in that office says, well, you don't qualify for this, but here's another program we have that maybe you qualify. Or maybe you ought to go to NRCS. I think they've got something over there. Maybe they've got something at Rural Development. We, we don't like to say no. And we don't want to ever say, hey, there's nothing we can do for you. We're going to try to do everything we can to help you. So if you get a chance, like I said, get to know the folks in your local office. Visit that office as much as you can. And we're here to help. I know sometimes we say that the federal government. We're from the federal government here to help. That sounds kind of scary sometimes, but we really are. We'd like to help as many of you as we can. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, um, Joe. <laughs> that was a very um insightful presentation. Thank you for that. We're gonna open the floor right now for questions, please, from the audience. Um, you can please omit yourself if you have specific question for the um our expert today. Question for Jamie, for Paul, and for Joe, please. Um, please go ahead. So I have a question. Are there any programs out there to help with perimeter fencing? So we have some programs to help with perimeter fencing, but it's really going to be for areas that maybe that are cropland that you're getting ready to convert to pasture land or something along those lines. It's not really for if you've got um, already established pasture land and you've got some fences that maybe need some help. Um, it's not to replace those fences. It's really to convert some pasture or something along those lines. Thank you, Paul. With yep. like say farm ownership and also our farm operating loans, I I think fencing might might fall in that category of being being helped from one of those programs because you know fencing is making your land more productive, uh, doing some things. So I think I think there would be a way. I don't know, honey, you'd have to talk with one of our loan people, but I think that there could be ways we could stretch that maybe where that would that would help out a little bit in one of those in one of those areas. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Hey, it's funny, something I heard the other day is uh, heard about these folks trying to develop hybrid sheep. I don't know if any of you all know about this or not, but I heard that there's a there's a producer over in Kyrgyzstan, which is over near China, the country of Kyrgyzstan. And apparently they've got a, a group of sheep over there, the Marco Marco Polo. And golly sheep. I don't know if you all heard of those or know much about those. Apparently, that Marco Polo and golly sheep is a very large sheep that's used for game hunting. And apparently, once somebody did from Montana, and this is illegal, uh, he apparently smuggled some genetic material from one of those Argoli sheep into the United States, sent that to a lab, created an embryo, and they had that embryo implanted in a female ewe, and they developed, they produced a male Argoli sheep, a large sheep in the state of Montana. And then that male sheep that they produced, I guess, impregnated several other ewes. And they've gotten several of these big Argoli sheep. And what they're trying to do, these sheep are, I guess, big ewes for hunting, mainly in Texas, game hunting and things like that. They were illegal in Montana. And I think this whole operation was probably illegal. But I thought that was kind of interesting to see. And I see that that did that did happen, but so, somehow those sheep were those parts were smuggled into the United States, and I don't know. It's kind of a little bit scary. Mm, that sounds interesting, to, uh, Joe. Just someone asked me, um, I think yesterday about regenerative agriculture. I don't even want to say something about that to the audience. Regenerative agriculture. Uh, can regen regenerative agriculture. So I'll I'll uh, jump on that. Um, so with regenerative agriculture, there are there is a push um, for regenerative agriculture. So I, I'm somewhat familiar with 
with the the principles of it so the the principle of regenerative agriculture is that your your um your your footprint on the the land is you're increasing organic matter and you're increasing you're not degrading that that condition um the university of missouri uh, rob myers has got a a uh grant with actually with with us a climate smart grant that they are working on um doing some regenerative practices with grazing um specifically and cover crops there's different phases i think the the first sign up for that has closed for the year um but there are going to be more signups uh to do that and and the way i understand it um they're going to they're going to pay an incentive to increase your your management on your on your pastures um whether it be uh more frequent moves or um you know, higher stocking densities, things like that to, to increase your, like I said, your organic matter and infiltration rates and things like that. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I read about that too, even from the university and I'm going to direct the producers to the right um, channel. Thank you so much, Jen. Any other question? Uh, Joe, could you please tell us more about the um, direct farm loan? What do you, what are the requirements for you to apply for direct and guaranteed loans, please, Joe? Well, one one program, probably our biggest dairy program, is what we call the Dairy Margin Coverage Program. And what that program involves is if the uh, you know if, if the price the price of feed and the price per milk, if the difference between those two is too low, then a producer will qualify for the Dairy Margin Coverage Program. Direct farm loan. I think he was asking about direct farm. Yeah, direct direct farm loan. Yeah, the, the requirement. Okay, what what did you want to know about that, David? Oh. The what what, what qualification for direct farm loans? What makes you qualify for that loan, please? Oh, for the for the, the direct farm loans. Yes. Well, you know, there you have to have it, and they'll do a, they'll do a little bit of a background check on you. And then they're going to find out, I mean, they're going to look at your operation, uh, mainly see if the operation that you have in, in mind that you're making, taking the loan for, be sure that operation has the ability to pay off that loan. You know, you can kind of look into the future and say, yeah, this looks like this is a productive operation. They've got enough livestock to make this happen or, you know, enough crops to make it happen, whatever. It just, you know, like I say, we try, we stretch every now and then we, and we try to take some chances and we try to help as many people as we possibly can. But on the other hand, before we loan money, we want to make sure that it looks like this producer has a reasonable chance of making those payments and the operation looks like it has a chance to be successful. Maybe this person has enough collateral, has some backing that, you know, if, if things start to go south, maybe another, another uh, assistance or another area of help that can kind of step in and step in and make a difference. Great. Thank you so much. Jamie, let me ask you this question, you know, um, from your point of view, um, from the drought and the grassland and the desert area, what can the farmer do right now in, in anticipation for, of course, we don't prefer drought, but uh, there are things they could plant now, the cover crops and stuff like that, just to, you know, to boost the the operation for, you know, for for, for drought and stuff like that. So, so right now, um, you know, somebody wanted to plant something today. Uh, about the only thing that we're going to get going right now that's going to be somewhat productive would be like spring oats. Um, but looking forward, um, you know, I like to to get our our summer annuals planted by you know, I used to say mid May, uh, but now the the way the droughts have been coming, we've backed that that time frame up to, um, you know, late April. Uh, mid to late April. So if, if, if you had a field that you were going to start a conversion on, uh, probably be, be thinking now about, uh, some, some herbicide treatment if, if you're going to completely kill the field out. Um, but going in with a, a summer annual, uh, is a great way to, to, to build a little resiliency into your, your operation as far as, um, you know, a lot of forage production, uh, you know, with small ruminants, uh, the, the options, you know, we could throw sun hemp and, and millet and things like that. Um, I really like sorghum sedan for my, for my cattle. Uh, some people are scared of that with the prussic acid and, and nitrate issues that can come with it. But, 
Um, I think as long as you're, you're careful and don't, don't dump a whole lot of nitrogen, which with the price of nitrogen right now, you're probably not going to dump too much on there. Um, but that, that's where I'd be planning right now, you know, something you could do, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks, kind of start that process to, to get yourself prepared for, for, for this, this coming summer. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to please ask Paul and Joe and possibly Jamie to give a final word, one minute each, just to wrap up, please. Um, Paul, please, over to you. Final word. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. Well, um, I think if I was just going to say one thing, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in uh, doing any sort of conservation or uh, grazing system out there on your land, um, like Joe had mentioned earlier, uh, just it'd be good to get into our offices and talk to our employees that we've got in there and uh, just work with them on trying to figure out uh, what uh, we can offer uh, that would fit your operation. And so, and really just communication with our employees there in the field offices is, uh, is the starting point. And like I said, we've got several um, programs that uh, the sign-up deadline is this Friday, March 29th, and uh, that Livestock Water Act Now, um, which includes um, Bates, Vernon, Barton, St. Clair, and Cedar Counties, a sign-up deadline on that is May 3rd. And so if you're interested in any of those, um, just go ahead and, and stop by the office or give uh, one of our offices a call and they can help you through the process. Thank you so much. Joe, one final word if I, uh, I turn to Jimmy. Joe, one final word, please. Thank you. Well, and, and you know, I think an issue I've talked a lot about is drought. In, in drought, I hope, again, we're not facing it this coming year like we have the last two years, but we very well could. And if you remember last year, the drought hit in the springtime. Normally, drought hits in the summer months of June, July, August. Last year, we had drought started in April, and I think some counties hit D3 maybe as early as May. And so any time that your county hits D3 on the drought monitor or D2 for eight consecutive weeks, then you're eligible for our drought assistance programs up until the end of the year, in, into January of the next year. So even if, you're, if your county would hit D3 in, let's say, June, and then you get where we get rain and, and you know, the weather conditions get better, if once you hit that drought, drought three, that D3 level on the drought monitor, you're eligible to get some relief. So I think that's important. Also, we talk about this avian flu. Uh, that could be if you lose a large number of animals due to something like that, then that LIP program, that uh, livestock indemnity program could kick in if you have an unusually large number of deaths to maybe help you with some of that. So I, I talk mainly about drought because I think that's probably what we have that maybe could help most of you, maybe the most. I hope hope we don't have to deal with it this year, but it, it's a very real possibility that we could. So, and again, like like Paul said, and, and James, good to see you also get get to know our get to know our folks get to be a regular customer with fsa I, and as i travel around i hear some folks say i don't know anything about fsa and others say oh i use their programs on a regular basis so get to know as many of our people as you can thank you so much joe um jamie one last word to our audience please uh i would just say uh you know in the wake of the droughts we've had stay flexible um be be uh be flexible in your, your stocking numbers and, and uh, feed options and watering options and everything like that. Um, also, you know, come into our, our county offices where you don't have to come in to do cost share. Uh, you know, we can do technical assistance, no charge, no, no nothing. Um, you know, everybody kind of as associates us with cost share money. Uh, but, you know, if you, you have questions, we've got some pretty good, pretty good field staff out there uh, scattered throughout the state that would, would love to help you, um, you know, or, or contact me. You've got my information too. And uh, we'd be, be glad to help you. Thank you. We've come to the end of this session. I want to get her here. Steve Niemeyer, who's a very valuable member of our state office staff, Carol Strother and Hannah Strain. They're our two outreach coordinators and they've helped with this program today. So very much appreciate them, their efforts and all they do on a daily basis. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Gerald. Thank you for your time, Paul. Thank you, Jamie, for your time. We really appreciate you for partnering with ME Expansion. I will look forward to calling you next time and have a great of your day. Thank you all for joining. Have a blessed day. Bye.